Well, praise the Lord. The Word of God says, in the book of Psalms, David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go up into the house of God. Let us go up yes. to the house of God. Hallelujah. You know, the house of God is a place where you go up. Yes. Amen. Think about that. That's, right. That's the way it's worded. He said, let us go up. He didn't say go to. He said, let us go up into the house of God. One place that you ought to experience acceleration as a direct result of you being in God's presence in the house of God in the assembly. That's what should happen. After this meeting or during this meeting, you should come up. You shouldn't be any less coming through these doors. That's not how we roll here. <laughs> Now, you think about it, we don't roll like that here. We're not just, we're just not gathering and get some little religious message. Nah, that's not how Jesus works. That's not how my Jesus works. I don't know about your Jesus. I'm talking about the Jesus of my Bible. You know, Paul said they preached unto, uh, unto you another Jesus, which there is no other. Now, isn't that an interesting statement? Some people are preaching another Jesus, which there is no other. Some people preach that Jesus doesn't heal today. That's a lie. That Think about that. Some people preach that Jesus is no longer a supernatural working God. That's a lie. Some people preach that Jesus no longer is answering people. No, that's, that's a lie. That's another Jesus. That's a different Jesus. I mean, you think about your closest friend. You think about your mom and daddy. I would hope you, you know them intimately. Those are the married. You're out there in the world, and they make a, if they say something about Robbie, I'm like, hold up, that's not, that's not Robbie. I know Robbie. You're lying on Robbie. You would oppose that person. You wouldn't hang out with that person. You would not continue to listen to that person. So why are Christians today, this morning, listening to lying preachers lying about your Lord and Savior? Think about that. That's, that's insane. Think about how perverted and how evil that actually is. And they preach it from the, from the same Bible. So that means they're not even preaching from this. And they're not preaching from on the inside where the Holy Ghost lives and resides. Think about that. You say, where are they getting their messages? From the cemetery. I mean, from the seminaries. No, seriously, I'm, what I'm saying. Or from other liars. I don't hang out with liars. I don't hang out with liars. Did you know that's the, one of the characteristics of a person that's going to be in the lake of fire? The Bible said liars. You know, the first quali you know what the first class of individuals are going to be thrown in the lake of fire? The book of Revelation said cowards. Think about that. You know who was a coward? Peter. Some people don't think about that, but he was an absolute coward. You say, I don't know. Jesus said, you're going to deny me. Three times before the rooster crows. But he spent three and a half years with Jesus, so he knew Jesus. But yet we see him acting like a coward. But when the Holy Ghost came, when the Holy Ghost came on that man, the Bible says he stood up. With all boldness. See, the Holy Ghost will make you bold. Yes. If the Holy Ghost is really working in your life, there's nothing cowardly about you. You are not going to back up, cower to your neighbor, to your friend, to your coworkers, to your boss, to the devil himself. You're like, no, the word says, and this is it. I'm living my life by the book. So that might require you to open up your mouth and stand up. Stand up for Jesus. Stand up for yourself. Because you know who you are. I'm not talking about being mean. I'm just talking about declaring and decreeing who you are in Christ. Because ain't no cowards in this room. You can't afford to be a coward. Because there's some things going to come at you in life that's going to require you to operate in boldness. And you might be the first one to have to stay up, stand up and say, No! Now, I said like that on purpose. Now, I, I mean, because some people stand up and say, no, please stop. No, that ain't going to get it. Devil's not listening to you. 
He knows you're afraid because of the tone of your voice. You say, how, how, why is that so important? The Bible says so many times in the Gospels, Jesus with a loud voice. Yes, sir. Jesus with a loud voice. That identifies tone. Jesus is not playing games with the enemy. We have an enemy. It's not your neighbor. It's not your kids. It's not your husband. It's not your wife. It's not your coworker. It's not your boss. It's not your in-laws. We all have a common enemy who works through all those entities that I just named. We have a common enemy. He's a fallen angel called Satan. And we ought not be ignorant of that. He is the one who puts sickness and disease on you. He is the one that's keeping you out of your answer. He's the one that's keeping you from this, keeping you from that, and you have to deal with him accordingly. Yes. You say, what do you mean? It is written. Amen. That's how we're dealing with him. Yes. Through the word. So I want you to look at your neighbor and say, you're not a coward. Tell him, say, you're a bold one. A bold one. Tell him, you're an anointed one. Anointed one. Say, there's no quitting in you. There's no backing up in you. Because no I know who lives in you. And I know who lives in me. And he's a victorious one. He's the victor. Who has given me the victory. Woo! Glory be to God. <laughs> Glory. Well, you may be seated. Praise the Lord. Good to see everyone here in the house of God. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Glory. Woo. It's good to be in God's house. Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, and then 16 through 18. We've been talking about the three pillars of faith. And we've been on this topic for some time now. And so um, if you need to get caught up to speed, uh, visit our YouTube page, Rain of Life Church International, and you will be sure to get caught up to speed to where we are right here. Um, but we have been talking about the three pillars of faith. And uh, we're talking about one of the most exciting, most popular uh, pillars to date <laughs> that the body of Christ just really loves to talk about. And that is fasting. <laughs> I didn't get a whole lot of amens on that one right there. <laughs> and so uh, today we're going to talk about the results of biblical fasting. The results. Matthew chapter 6. Three pillars of faith. Take heed that you do not do your alms or your giving before men to be seen of them. Otherwise you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore when... Notice that word, when. When you do your alms, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say to you, they have their reward. But when you do your alms, let not your left hand know what your right hand does, that your alms may be in secret, and that your father which sees in secret himself shall reward you openly. And when you pray, notice that, when you pray. We just read when you give or when you give alms. When you pray, um, you shall not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say to you, they have the reward. Their reward is that the men, pe people see them doing it. But when you pray, enter into your closet. It doesn't have to be a physical closet, although if that's where you want to pray, fine. But the idea is a solitary place, alone. Get yourself alone with God, away from uh, things that can distract, away from the kids, away from the cat, away from the dog, away, away from the bird. Put that sheet over that cage so he won't be talking, you know, until you come out the club. I mean, you know, do what you got to do, you know, to get away from anything that will distract you. Turn that cell phone off. You said, what if I have an emergency? Well, if you're praying right, the one that sees all and knows all will alert you. <laughs> I mean, what did you do before you had that smartphone? What did they do? Well, I use an alarm clock. What did they do before they had alarm clocks? See what I'm talking about here? We think we need certain things and we don't. We, they told us that's what we needed because we're the consumers. And they are consumers as well. 
they consume our dollars. Yeah. Okay, all right. <laughs> okay, okay. So you don't think you don't need what you think you need. Okay, all right. You know when the hurricanes come in, you know you can't hardly you can't use some cell phones. You know, you still have to use a landline. Flying to Miami International Airport, you'll see things that you don't even see here in the state of Texas. Yeah. You see pay phones. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. True. Yep. True story. Am I telling the truth? When we go to Guyana, we have to stop over and lay over in Miami, and they got uh, pay phones all over the airport. Mm -hmm. And we took pictures and said, what are these, you know? All right. <laughs> 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 But when you pray into your closet and when you have shut your door, pray to your father, which is in secret, and your father which sees in secret shall reward you openly. Then verse 16, more of a when you fast. Oh, man, that's awesome. Woo, glory. More of a when you fast. Be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to fast. Verily I say to you, they have their reward. But when you fast, notice the word when. When you fast, anoint your head and wash your face that you appear not to men to fast, but to your father, which is in secret, and your father, which sees in secret, shall reward you openly. Now, what's interesting is, is that Jesus expects those that follow him to do these three things. Because he's speaking, and he's saying, when you do this, when you give, when you pray. Now, what I've discovered in the body of Christ, we've done a lot of talking about giving and praying and of all those discussions all those years half of the believers don't do those or if they do they don't do them properly they don't diligently flow with them they don't make it a lifestyle and one of the reasons I'm gonna tell you listen listen to what I'm saying now here this is not a condemnation message nor do we promote condemnation but how many you know we need to be corrected. Yes. Now, correct, I tell my kids, correction is not a bad thing. No. That's right. But if you never get corrected, that means you're a bastard. Right. That means you don't have a father that loves you. Right. Now, the Bible tells us that correction is lovely because it produces the precious fruit. It produces God, peaceful fruit. That's what the word says, peaceful fruit, right? So if you never get corrected, you can't grow like you should. That's right. Right? Amen. So listen to what I'm getting ready to say right now. The number one reasons why Christians do not give and pray consistently is because of circumstances. Amen. Because you've allowed the circumstances to dictate to you what you cannot do. Because right. Solomon said, even in the area of giving, a person who observes the wind will not sow. The wind is an, uh, uh, an analogy of circumstances and things in the word of God. So people look at the circumstances and they say stuff like, I can't afford to give. Right. Well, you can't afford not to. Right. And then the second reason is simply flat out disobedience. Yeah. You just will not do it. Or you just don't do it. Now, at the sound of my voice, Based on me saying what I just said, if you leave out of here and you never attempt to give the way God tells you to give, then you fit number two. You say, how can I say that? How can I talk to you? Didn't you just read the same scriptures I just read? Yeah. Jesus said, when you give, he expects you to give. Yeah. He says, when you pray, he's expecting you to pray. Yeah. Now, the lack of success in any area in life is a failure to pray. That's the number one purpose of praying. So you can get headquarters information. Mm -hmm. Headquarters is heaven. Right. Now, now think about what I'm getting ready to say. How many of you in this room, you faced the problem, faced the issue, and your first reaction was people? I'm going to get on the phone, I'm going to call so-and-so, or your first reaction was Google. Now, now, today it's Google, but in my day, growing up, my, my kid's age, it would have been an encyclopedia. It would have been Webster. It would have been Mama and Daddy. It would have been my, my, what they call them people, BFF, or I mean, I don't know what they call them people today. It would be, be, be the best friend, right? But really what you're doing is, is praying. 
You never thought about it like that. But that's what you're doing. You're looking to some other person for an answer. Meaning you're looking to engage with someone, and when you engage with that person, you expect to them to speak to you back, right? So how is it any different? If we say God's alive, and we just sang all these songs that he's alive, why wouldn't he answer you when you talk to him? That's simply what prayer is. So, so people don't really think that that really works. It's prayer. Because you don't see God, but you see your mama, you see your neighbor, and you see what they say on Google. Right? And so now we've taken ourselves out of the best life we can live, which is a supernatural life, because we're judging how we're living by what we see with these two eyes. Instead of realizing, now God's invisible, Holy Ghost is invisible, angels are invisible, but I know they're with me because the book tells me I'm living by what's written, I'm going to pray, and I believe I'm going to receive, and I'm going to expect God to speak to me, and I will hear his voice because the Bible says in John chapter 10, my sheep hear my voice, and I'm a sheep back, I'm a sheep, I'm dumb. I don't know what direction to go in. I don't even know where the water is. I can smell it. But I don't even know what direction the brook is in, the direction the lake's in. I need the shepherd that's out in front of me and say, come on now, come on now. Come on over here now. This is where the water is. You understand what I'm saying? I'm just a dumb sheep. And that is okay, Sister Linda. And that's the greatest place you can put yourself in is total humility. Meaning, as a sheep, I will not survive. A wolf will take my life and devour me unless I'm really following the shepherd. And you want to follow the shepherd. Because he will lead you by green pastures. Not no, not no uh, dead ones. Still waters. You know what that's talking about? You see, Jesus is really trying to lead us away from all these circumstances. Still waters. He's not trying to bring you to choppy waters. That represents the storm, Mark chapter 4. See, what happens, we, get our, we bring more trouble upon ourselves because we're unwilling to engage in these three pillars. Because remember, the greatest prayer that Jesus said we could pray, he taught us how to pray, was actually the model or the outline of praying, which is in Matthew chapter 6. He says, pray and that you lead us not into testings and trials. See, one of, the pl- one of the purposes of prayer is you get divine wisdom and answers to where you escape the snares of life. But there are some that you cannot because Jesus said it. He said offenses will come. Trouble will come. In this world, you will have trouble. But be of good cheer for I'm overcome the world system. Why? Because greater is he that's on the inside of than he that's in the world system. You see? See, problems shouldn't rock us. We're like, oh, I can take care of that. No, did you get what I just said? I didn't say he can. I said you can. That's, that's the purpose. One of the purposes of reigning life is to get, take, take away this demonic, devilish sovereignty doctrine out of the minds of Christians that think God's just doing everything. Yeah. Come on now. Mm-hmm. Jesus said you're going to have to open your mouth and speak to the mountain. You say why? Because his voice print is not even in your problem. God just take care of this problem. Now he can't. His voice print's not programmed in that problem. Yours is. Yeah. Your problem is voice act. See, the covenant's voice activated, and your problem, whether you realize it or not, has your voice imprinted in it, and it has to oh, obey yeah. you. He says, when you speak into the mouth, it will obey you. Yes, that means my voice print's already in there. It's programmed in the problem, praise yeah. God. Yeah. It's in the problem. Yeah. <laughs> you think about that. When you think about that, it's in the problem. Right. Your voice. Wow. So when you respond to it properly, oh, I got to obey my master. Jesus is the master of storms. Yes, sir. So are you. Yes. So are you. But we need to realize that. Now, Mark chapter 2. So he expects us to give, pray, and to fast. But you don't hear a whole lot of teaching on fasting. And there's a reason why. Because people like to eat. And they don't want to talk about not eating. Mark chapter 2, verse 18. And the disciples of John, now this is disciples of John coming to Jesus. And the disciples of John and of the Pharisees used to fast, or they were fasting. That's what that says in the Greek. And they come and say to him, which is Jesus, why do the disciples of John and of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples fast not, or they don't fast? 
So I want you to get a clear picture of this. Jesus is teaching them in Matthew chapter 6, when you give, when you pray, and when you fast. But here the question is presented to Jesus, we're the disciples of John and we fast often. And we know we're the disciples of the Pharisees and we fast often, but how come your disciples are not fasting? Which means it must have been a tradition or expected that students or disciples that had a master, they were accustomed to fasting. But Jesus' disciples are not fasting. And he's okay with them not fasting. So let's read this. And Jesus said to them, Can the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast or they will not fast. Now Jesus is the bridegroom. What he's basically saying is there's no need for them to fast because I'm with them. I mean, you think about it. Jesus was the representative of heaven itself and all the fullness of the Godhead dwelled in him bodily. When you had him physically on the earth, you didn't need to fast. Why? Because you looked to him for answers. He could multiply the bread and the fish. If you didn't have enough finance, you can tell Peter, go, you know, first fish you catch up, you'll find a coin. Go pay my taxes, your taxes. See, Jesus paid taxes. But you got Christians don't pay taxes. But anyway, that's another, that's just came out. But anyway, and so, you know, and then they had supernatural things happening. But Jesus is doing all of that. He turned water into wine, right? But notice what he said. But the days will come. When the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days, and we're living in those days. Because he's been taken away. Jesus is no longer on the earth. Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father. And he sent another one, the same one that was on him in his earthly ministry, called the Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit lives in us, and I trust he's also on you in power to do the same works that he did. That's what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is all about. Now, notice what he said, in those days, they will fast. So it's safe to say, because he's the one talking about this, that means Jesus must have lived that fasted life as well. Because he's away. He's away from his father. Jesus is not in heaven fasting. But he fasted when he became a man. And he had to fast because he's away from all that glory. And he has a flesh body like you and I that can potentially get in the way of spiritual things. Remember we talked about that last Sunday. Your flesh can be like a veil that separates you from going into your spiritual life. Yeah. So fasting crucifies the flesh. It weakens it. It's actually the number one way to kill yourself. Think about it. If you don't eat past 40 days, let's say this. If you don't eat and drink past 40 days, what will happen to your physical body? It will what? Shut down and die. So that tells us that when we, do, we, when we set some time away to not eat, we're actually killing ourselves. Which means we're making that guy weaker but then you should make this guy on the inside stronger. Right, right. right? Now, Matthew chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. Look at this real quick. Because I'm dealing with this right now. He is expecting us to not only pray and give, but he's also expecting us to fast as well. The disciple is not above his master nor the servant above his Lord. Now, if you and I do not have to give, pray, and fast, then that would make us above him. Right. Meaning that there's another way that you and I can tap into the blessed life outside of the principles that he exercised in his life. And if that's true, that would make us above him. But no one's above Jesus. Right. No one's above Jesus. He is our master. And so if he gave, if he prayed and he fasted, then if we want to be like him, then we will engage in these three areas consistently. 
We will not just be doing them, hitting and missing. We wouldn't pick and choose, say, well, I'm going to do it two times out of the year, and that's going to be it and satisfy the requirement. I'm going to give two times. I'm going to pray once a month. You know, I mean, you know, but, but I'm just saying these scenarios are happening. But in reality, you don't eat once a month. You don't, you don't, I mean, you don't drink water twice a month. You don't drink water twice a year. You're eating three and four and five, six snacks in between all throughout the day. And that's just one day. One day, you didn't, how much, how much Coke or tea, like Texas sweet tea did you jug down in two hours? How many snacks did you? I gotta get my snacks. I gotta get them because if I don't eat, I'm gonna be. You know, you know. People say if I don't eat, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be mean. You know, you, you need a Snickers. I mean, I mean, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I mean. I mean, you understand what I'm saying? People are so accustomed to eating. They really are, and that's actually one of the major problems. The reason why a lot of people sick, because in a lot of our food, it carries toxins. <laughs> and one way you get rid of all them toxins is you fast. And we'll talk about it in another message with the effect that fasting has on your physical body. But anyway, um, verse 25, it is enough for the disciple that he be as his master. See, if we're going to be like him, we need to do these things. Luke chapter 6, verse 40, it says, the disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect or mature shall be as his master. See, if we're going to walk in maturity, we're going to be like him. Remember I gave the analogy, like if you, if you say, I'm going to go enroll in karate. You know, so many parents enroll their kids in karate because they want their kids to be able to defend themselves. But it also has another effect. It actually, you know, it's a, it's a confidence booster and things like that. It's, it's amazing how all that works. But anyway, uh, you, enroll your child, you enroll your child in the martial arts, you expect them to practice, huh? Because you're paying money. You expect him to do what the sensei says or his master. Especially if you want to see him advance through the ranks, you know, go from white belt to yellow belt. You say, did you test? Did you, did you practice? So when you take the test, right? So if you're expecting your child to study and to be like the one training him, why wouldn't it be any different when it comes to the Spirit of God training us to be like Jesus? We have to do the things he said do. And sometimes doing these three things, I'm just going to be honest with you. Well, I ain't like I've been lying to you anyway. But I'm just, but I'm just be honest with you. <laughs> Brother Matt, we say certain stuff like, man, were, hey, were you lying to me before? No, but, but I, <laughs> I mean, it's amazing what we say, you know, to save time. You can't save time. Man, if you can save time, man, I, if I could save time, I would have stopped at 30. But anyway, <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> Some of y'all will get that in a minute. But anyway, <laughs> but anyway, um, I forgot what I was saying. What was I saying? See, I'm just, I'm just testing. She said Luke 6. <laughs> that means you weren't even paying attention to what I was saying. But anyway, <laughs> but, anyway but the disciple's not above his master. His sensei. <laughs> But anyway, if we want to be like Jesus, we have to, I know what I was saying, we have to do the things he's doing. And to be honest with you, that's where I was, and to be honest with you, it doesn't feel good to do these things sometimes. And let's talk about, let's talk about giving for a moment because, because this is a reality. Sometimes in obeying God, it's not always going to be Easy to do, especially given. I mean, you know, your circumstance show up, your, your heater go out, your, in your car, you know, your fl tires, you, you go flat. You're like, man, I got to get three new tires. I was only going to plan on getting two. You know, now I got to come out some more money. You know, that's kind of potentially dipping in my money or put me in a position to where, oh, man, I know I'm supposed to tie, but man, if I have to tie, it's going to be real tight. But you can tie. But it's going to be tight after you do it. But some people are not willing to be that uncomfortable to see the supernatural. You see, that's the greatest time you can display obedience to see God work. And so some people say, hold it, and next month or next week, I'll do it, but I'll double up. 
Nah, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up now. Now, that ain't you talking. Now, <laughs> hold on, I'm just trying to show you now. I'm trying to show you how these three pillars work. That ain't you talking. That's your flesh man talking through your carnal mind. Because I'm telling you, if you yield to that, the devil say, I got him. And then another circumstance going to go come up that's going to dip into the tithe money to where you can't double up next time because you left the crack open. I know what I'm talking about because you must, you must have guessed it. I've done that. See, I, I, I mean, come on now. I've done that. I've just got to be, on, I gotta be honest with you and show you how this works. And then you feel guilty like I plan on doubling. I can't double up. And then you realize by experience where you went wrong. And you correct and say, no, nah, I ain't going to let the devil dupe me again. No, that's right. Here's praying. I'm, you got to learn how to not keep sleeping. Yeah. Yeah. Wake up. That's it. You're not going to die. Yeah. It's amazing how much sleep you don't require. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. I don't, I don't know if I told you this. When, and, I, and I'll give a reference point when I really start engaging fasting again. I, you know, I couldn't sleep like eight hours. I couldn't sleep even six. I was up four and five hours. Like I had slept eight. And I'm like, what's going on? Well, I was refreshed in my physical body. Because I'm also, when I'm fasting, partaking of my real life. And we'll talk about that in a moment. And it, there's a surge of energy that comes from your inner man upon your physical flesh to where you realize you don't require that much sleep. Now I know how Jesus did ministry. How could he be in the mountain praying all more, all not all more, all eve, all afternoon into the evening, and you don't see him sleeping? But you know, you, you, we know he does sleep because we see him sleeping on the boat. But he's not doing a whole lot of sleeping like everybody else. You said, "How do I know that?" Go look at Matthew chapter twenty-six. Why are you sleeping? Can you not pray one hour? So he's not sleeping or getting the sleep like everybody else is getting. So how is he doing that? He's living supernaturally. Sleeping when he needs to sleep. Eating when he needs to eat. Did you get what I just said? If we could just learn to sleep when we need to sleep and eat when we need to eat, how busy will we be for the Lord? Now, the definition of the word fast is the Hebrew word sum. T-S-O-W-M. It means to close or to cover the mouth. So the word fast means to close or cover the mouth. Simply meaning you abstain from eating food. That is the biblical definition of fast or fasting. Simply means don't eat food. Okay? But now this is what some Christians are doing. I call this New Age fasting. New Age fasting. And it's amazing how, and I know why the believers have, why a lot of believers have done it. I'm going to fast TV for a few days. Okay. I'm going to fast Facebook for 30 days. And you send a message. You say, people, I'm going to get off Facebook for 30 days. I'm going to fast Facebook for 30 days. You, you, I mean, you, uh, okay, uh, man, I've been, you know, I've been eating a lot of desserts lately, so I'm going to fast sugar for 30 days, which means I'm not going to eat any desserts for 30 days. I'm going to fast this, I'm going to fast this, fast that for 30 days. And you say that's fasting. No, that's not fasting. That's you making certain decisions on what you're going to do with your flesh. But that's not fasting on a biblical level. Now, when you're fasting, I don't recommend you continue to watch your average amount of TV or engage in social media because that should be a time to where you're devoting to God and you're spending time fellowship with God. Now, like, for example, if you would ask me, how to fast because you know there is a way to fast because if you just fast which means you don't eat food but you do not pray that is not fasting that's called starvation <laughs> okay okay i mean come on now. And, and then and then that won't work you're going to end up breaking it because you're going to that hunger pain going to get to you and say i'm going to go ahead and eat 
because you didn't engage in the, your spiritual food to help you curb that, right? And then it's also called dieting. It's called intermittent fasting. That's what the world does. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about biblical fasting, right? So if you would ask me how to fast, I would say, I would recommend if you're going to fast, at least pray or devote some time to God at least one hour during that t a day during your fast. Like if you fast three days in a row or you fast one day, separate, set aside one hour to pray. You say, why? Because that's what the re that's an easy requirement. You say, how's that an easy requirement? Can you not pray for me for one hour? That's in Matthew 26. And then if you get in the church age, which is the book of Acts, it says they went to the hour of prayer. So the early church was accustomed to at least spending one hour in prayer every day. You never looked at it like that. You just said, when you, when you thought we'd go to the hour of prayer, well, it was at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, they just went at 3 o'clock. No, they, they're, follow, they're being like who? They're being like their master. Where do you think they learned that? Because it says our doctrine is built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Yeah. So they are teaching us what they were taught by Jesus. Matthew 28, go into all the world and teach them to observe all things I taught you. So they taught the early church that you should at least be setting aside one hour in devotion to God every single day. So if you don't do that while you're fasting, you might as well just go and eat a bowl of oatmeal, just go ahead and get some ribs out, just eat. Because your fast is not going to accomplish anything. I'm just telling you. You have, to, you have to devote to God. You have to. It's imperative that you do that. Um, isn't it interesting? Here Jesus is. He gets baptized in that River Jordan. And the first thing he was led to do was fast. Let's look at it. Luke chapter 4. So, and we're going to talk about the Daniel fast and why people think that's scriptural. I'm going to give you scriptures for it. And it's not, it's not even a thing. You need to get rid of that. Yeah. And we're going to show you. Luke chapter 4, verse 1. And Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost. Notice the terminology. He's full of the Holy Ghost. He returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, <clears throat> being 40 days tempted of the devil. Now notice this, and in those days, he did eat nothing. Meaning he voluntarily did this. He chose not to eat. Now this is supernatural because we find out that Jesus fasted for 40 days. Now you and I are not required to fast for 40 days. Now I know people, I have friends, matter of fact, I know people that have done it. I mean, I don't. But they were, obviously they were led to do it because they're still here. They're still living. Yeah. I know Brother Copeland's done it. I know Brother Trace's done it. I got a friend in uh, North Carolina that's done it. And, and I've just recently talked to him, him about doing it. But he was led to do it. Yeah. And when they did it, it reset their bodies. But anyway, um, but we'll talk about that at a later date. But, um, but in the Bible, there were only two people that did a 40-day fast. One that was Moses, and here's Jesus. But we don't live our lives according to Moses. We live our lives according to Jesus. Mm -hmm. But now Jesus is not requiring us to fast for 40 days because that was done supernaturally. Mm -hmm. you, you See, let me, like, let me get, like Moses, like Moses did not eat or drink for 40 days. So that means that glory when he was in that cloud sustained him supernaturally. And we know it because when he came out of that, he had to put a veil over his face because he was shining so bright. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Now we know Jesus this is supernatural because of the way he answered the devil. He said, he said, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So you said, what does that mean? I'm not, now get a hold of what I'm saying. Now get a hold of what I'm getting ready to say. His father didn't say fast for 40 days. That's not what his father said. His father said go in that wilderness for 40 days. Okay, okay, you, you got you, I'm trying to help because I'm talking about the results of biblical fasting, but right now I'm working with what is biblical fasting, what does it look like, right? So now, Jesus, the Holy Spirit leads him to be tempted or tested by the devil for 40 days. So Jesus knew he was going to be in there for 40 days. So he made a decision I'm going to fast 
not eat food for the 40 days I'm in the wilderness. Now, we know that was a supernatural decision. Why? Because of what he said. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word. So now we know what he's eating for 40 days. That's keeping him alive. The word he got from God is keeping him alive. So he found out the thing that, that his real life is contained in the word. Come on now. Did you get what I just said? So this is what fasting, this is what you do. When you make a decision to say, I'm not going to eat food, that doesn't mean you're not eating. Yeah. But, 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 but if you don't read the Bible, if you don't spend time praying, you're not eating on a spiritual level. You're just simply dieting or starving yourself. So that's why I said when you fast, when you don't feed this guy, feed the guy on the inside. Read the Bible, quote the Bible, confess, pray, spend time with God in devotion. Why? Because during that time, you're partaking of your real life. And that's where your life comes out of is the realm of the spirit. It comes out of the realm of the spirit. You know, um, let, me look, let, me, let me find that real quick since I just said that. Let me see if I can find it. Is either there, or, uh, yep, it's in Galatians, I know it. Because if it's not there, it's in Galatians. Yep, there it is. Uh, we're going to go back, uh, go to Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 and 17. Now, I'm working with this idea of when I starve my natural man, I must feed my spiritual man. So now the Bible talks about there's a two sides to you. Well, actually, you're a three-part being. But may, for the first part, there are two sides to you. There's a natural side and there's a spiritual side. Well, too many times we're so natural and we should be spiritual because your spiritual life is where all the success, all the answers reside, right? But you don't tap, just tap into that just because you might just be a Bible reader. You understand what I'm saying? Or you go to church all the time. You got to exercise these three these three pillars. Now, this one will accelerate you, and we're talking. That's what we're talking about. Now, look at verse sixteen. This I say then: Walk in the spirit, and you will not fulfill the what? The lust of the flesh. He said, "Walk in the spirit," and then verse seventeen. Now, this word "spirit," walk in the spirit. He's not talking about the Holy Spirit. See, see, th see. Th this this is why it's important to have good sound teaching, right? Because right here. In this chapter, if you go down to verse 22, he's going to talk about the fruit of the Spirit. And a lot of people think that's talking about the fruit of the Holy Spirit. But let, let's think about this. The Holy Spirit don't have fruit. He doesn't need it. Okay, okay. What, this is Actually, let's read verse 22 real quick. But the fruit of the Spirit, is fruit plural or is it singular? Why do we call it the fruits of the Spirit? It's not true. If you read this, see the punctuation is in the wrong place. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. That's the number one fruit. See, this is why, this is why you need to fast and you need to pray. And then when you read the Bible, the Holy Spirit can straighten out your doctrine. Because I'm reading this during a time of praying and fasting, and the Holy Ghost said, many of my people have been saying this wrong. There are not nine fruits of the Spirit. He said, you read it. He said, there's only one fruit, and he said to me on the inside, he said, the punctuation is the wrong place. He said, there's only one fruit, there's love, but love has eight attributes, and you know I'm telling you the truth. Now go read 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23 is the same thing he said to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 13, same attributes. So these are the attributes of love. The Holy Spirit doesn't need love. He is love. The Holy Spirit doesn't need temperance. He is con in control. You understand what I just said? We need these attributes. 
So then again, I'm telling you, he's not referring to the Holy Spirit in this verse. He's saying, walk in your born again, redeveloped human spirit. See, you got to walk in your human spirit. You've been born of incorruptible seed, but how do you know it? How do you know that new man on the inside is victorious? How do you know it? Well, you got to tap into him. He said, put on the new man in Christ. Put him on. How do you put him on? I'm telling you one way you put him on. How do you know it? Because your flesh opposes you. Remember Paul said that? He said, the things I want to do, there's something on the inside of me preventing me to do what I want to do. You, you understand? And the things I don't want to do, I find myself doing it. So he's talking about that internal war that's going on between him and his flesh, not between him and God. You're not warring with God. Well, some people do. I mean, they disobey him. And, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about, but I'm telling you, if a Christian engages in giving, praying, and fasting, you will not oppose God. Something will happen to your life. Now, see, see, people don't like to talk, this, talk about this, like because uh, I happen to bring this out because I, I know my Lord. I can tell you the truth. If Jesus did not live a life of fasting and prayer, he would be disobedient to his father. We wouldn't see him walking in all those miracles, and we wouldn't even see him in the garden. Matter of fact, we'd say, man, forget this mess. Let them die. <laughs> I mean, come on now. That's what he would have done. Am I telling you? Y'all know I'm telling the truth because he's warned right there with his spirit, man. He knew what the will of God was because he told his disciples, I must be betrayed, given in the hands of the evil men, and go to the cross. And then he got in the garden. I don't know. Is there another cup? Is there another way out? And how many times we do that? Is there another way out? And we were like, I'm going to go ahead and take that way out when you know it's not a way out. What did you just do? You yielded to your flesh. But if you learn how to kill that guy consistently by praying and fasting, so we know in that garden then for three hours he's praying and fasting. He's praying and fasting. You see? And he was able to be victorious. He said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will. See, how could he say not my will? He had to find a way to humble his will. David said, I humble my soul, which is the will, through fasting. You see, this is all throughout our Bible. These are secrets, but they're in plain sight. See, he just not, he didn't wake up every morning and say, man, I'm going to go ahead and heal some blind people today. I'm going to raise some people out of casket because I know it's going to be a funeral. I'm going to the meetings. I'm going to do some bunch of stuff. Ooh, it's going to be on in these meetings. No, <laughs> no. He prepared himself. That's what we see him doing in Luke chapter 4. We'll go back there in a moment. Now, notice verse 17. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary or in opposition the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that you would. You see what's going on here? Your flesh is the thing that's really standing in the way of you having victory. And your inner man wants you to have victory. On the inside, you know you're supposed to have victory. So how do you win? You got to find a way to murder that guy. You got to find a way to put him out of commission. And the one way to put the flesh out of commission is to put it down by not eating. And you know you're winning when you make the decision. Because you said tomorrow I'm going to fast. Like I fast on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. And so Monday will come. And my flesh, I hear my flesh saying, Tuesday's coming. <laughs> Seriously. Tuesday's coming. Go to the buffet now. <laughs> I mean, that's how your flesh talks. It's amazing. And I guarantee you, your, same, your flesh will say the same stuff. I mean, go to buffet. Tuesday's coming. Eat, eat your favorite stuff. What can you eat today? I mean, and plus, matter of fact, you can do this as a cheat day because you're going to be fasting after all the next three days. So just eat all you can. Then Tuesday comes. You sure you want to fast today? I mean, I mean that's all coming from your flesh. That, that lets you know you're winning. And it's amazing, some of you, this is what has happened. You've attempted to do this and you get a headache. You're like, oh, hold on, oh, I feel weak. Yeah, we've been talking about that. You're winning if you feel weak. Don't fall for the okie-doke, the headache. 
That's the big one. I need to eat something. That's why I got a headache. Who's saying that? Your flesh is telling you to eat because you got a headache. You see, that's the greatest time you can partake of your real life. So I ain't got no headache. That's you trying to get me to eat. I bind, I break this headache. I'm going to fast. Oh, I feel dizzy. I had to eat something. No, sit down. Drink some water. Keep fasting. Because if you let that trip you up, when will you continue to go further? You won't. Which means you will not grow and increase in the things of God. You see? Now, I don't recommend doing a three-day, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday without. No, I don't. I, I never tell a person to fast without water. I always say drink water. I, like, I wouldn't even advise against, like, you know, juices, you know. Like, sometime I'll drink, like, some unsweet tea or, or sometime I'll drink, like, some coconut water, you know, while I'm fasting. But I don't drink, I like, I don't even drink coffee because of what I found out that ca what caffeine can do to the body and what fasting does to the body. We'll talk about all that. So the best thing you can do is just simply drink water or, you know, like, I drink some unsweet tea sometimes. I know that has some little caffeine in it, but I don't drink much, right, maybe a glass or two to kind of psych my man, my flesh out. Convinced, like you did drink something differently other than water. I'm just telling you, that's what, that's what I do. So I don't recommend doing a three day. What I recommend, if it's tough for you, start off with a meal. Like if you eat five and six meals a day, miss one. Then step it up, do a, do a, do a, a 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. fast. That's what we're gonna do with our kids on Wednesdays. We're going to require them to fast from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. Because that's not even a full 24 hours. But then after that one, increase it to a full 24-hour fast. Well, you do one day. Then increase it to two. Then increase it to three, you see. And then whatever you want to do after that, that's between you and God. But I'm not going to recommend anybody fast more than three days at a given time. Now, if that's something you want to do, you do it. But I will advise you to drink water during that time to keep your organs function the way they're supposed to function, you know. Um, so going back to Luke 4, I just wanted to show you that real quick, that, that there's a war going on, and you win the war by not just simply just not eating, but you win when you begin to eat your real food, right? So now Jesus, uh, uh, you know, he passed all those tests in the garden. Now look at verse, look, verse 14, what happened to him. And Jesus returned into what? Now, you can, when you read your Bible, it's okay to ask questions, well, how did that happen? Mm -hmm. Why did that show up? Because I just read in verse 1, he was only full of the Holy Ghost. But now I see he's coming in the power of the Spirit. How did that take place? And so many people, when they preached this, Brother Matt, they said the reason why he came out in the power is because he stood up there by quoting the word. That ain't all he did. He did quote the word, but he did something that was very important. He didn't eat. So you have to start asking yourself these questions. Like, I wonder if that's a principle or a key that, that had to go with that because we see him not eat. Why? You almost have to ask, because he's our master. I'm looking at him like, what he doing? Why he do that? Why he spitting that dirt like that and make some clay? Why he say that in Hebrew, which means be open? Why did he stick his fingers in that deaf man's ear? I wonder if I can do that when I come across a deaf person. I'm going to try that because I see my master do that. I'm telling you, by the Holy Ghost, if you want to be a miracle worker, you do what he did. I'm imitating him. See, that's why we don't see miracles because we're not being like our master. Man, I'm t look, I'm t I just gave you some, some secrets. It ain't about us what we've seen in our services. See, so you limited yourself. Maybe that man's not totally crossed over and being like his master, and we just see him just only laying hands. Mm -hmm. But Jesus just didn't only lay hands, Sister Carol. Mm -hmm. He did just like this. Be open! But see, you ain't going to go there if you're in the flesh, because your flesh going to say, that man got, probably got wax in his ears. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to spit in the sandbox over here, because what if that don't work? See, you in the flesh. See, Jesus, when he did all that, he wasn't in the flesh. He was in the spirit. And he learned how to do those things, whether you realize it or not, through prayer and fasting. 
by keeping his flesh under because he was taking over spiritual life. You, you got to look at it like this. Like there's a thickness, like there's like a, there's a barrier. There's a thickness that sometimes separates you from the, the real realm you're supposed to be operating. It's the supernatural, right? And you're trying to cross over in there. You see what I'm saying? I know that might sound strange the way I'm saying that, but it's simply the truth. You're trying to cross over in there. How can I melt that down? And, and I'm not talking, I'm, I'm talk uh, you're the barrier. You're the barrier. So it's amazing that when you begin to fast and pray, you might start having dreams, visions, hearing his voice more clearly. Why do you think that is? Because you're moving, moving the veil. Yeah. And you're really seeing in the realm of the spirit. You're seeing spiritual things like you should. Yeah. You're seeing life as you should. Mm -hmm. You see? Now, so he returned in the power of the spirit. Now, um, Look at John 14, 12. Now, now this will have new meaning now. Because of what we've been talking about these weeks, this verse will actually have new meanings. Now you'll realize you have to qualify to walk in this verse. Truly, truly, I say to you, he that believes on me, the miracles that I do, will he do also, and greater miracles than these shall he do because I go to my father. Because I go where? Now, what did Jesus just say in Matthew chapter uh, 10? I mean, Mark chapter 2. He says, when I go away in those days, they will do what? Fast. Now, he said they would work like this when I do what? Go to my father. So now we know he's not just talking about because you get the name of Jesus. See, you got, that's not all he taught us, being our master. He taught us how to give. He taught us how to pray. He taught us how to fast, and now he says, I'm leaving. Now, when you do these, when I leave, then you'll do the same works. Wow. Wow, that's you see what I'm saying? Yeah. See, that's why miracles hadn't been working like they should, because we think that we're above him. We think when we go to Kroger's, we see somebody in a wheelchair, we just lay hands on them, tell them to get them out their wheelchair, but don't attempt that. Mm -hmm. If you hadn't been praying, if you hadn't been giving, and you hadn't been fasting, because if that kind of miracle working power can happen through you and you hadn't been giving, you hadn't been praying, you hadn't been fasting, that would make you greater than Jesus. That's some good stuff, isn't it? That's some good teaching, isn't it? And that's not legalistic because the kingdom of God works through principles. Spiritual laws govern this thing. And so what do you think that's going to do to you when you know you've been giving? You know you've developed a lifestyle of prayer. I'm not talking about being perfect. But then you know you're having to develop a lifestyle of fasting. What is it going to do for you? You'll be like Jesus. Bring him here to me. Yeah. Oh. Come on now. I'm talking about a boldness. Come, bring him here to me. You can't, you can't work with him. You, you, there's no answer for him. He done been to the psychiatrist. Tell him to come to Rain Life Church on Sunday. Yeah. Just bring them to the church. Yeah. God will minister to them. See, see something will happen to you because you have, you've tapped into something. That's how Jesus responded. Because we're talking about the results of fasting. So go to Matthew chapter 17. Because remember, Jesus is not doing anything as the son of God. He's doing all this as the son of man. Which means as a man anointed by the spirit. So here it is, Matthew chapter 17, verse 14. Uh, we'll just let the word speak for itself. And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic. He crazy. Jesus specializes in dealing with crazy. <laughs> I mean, come on now. He's a lunatic and sore vexed, greatly troubled. For often he falls into the fire and often into the water, which means what his dad is saying. Every time I get around a body of water, I know he acts up and start having a fit to the point he almost drowns. Then we got a little campfire going. Then he get to acting up, acting crazy, almost falling in the fire. And I got to grab him. You know that's the context you're talking about. Because what fire, how are you going to fall in the fire? How are you going to fall in the fire? Because you and I wouldn't even be able to say that today if this was happening to one of our kids. Because what fire do you have, have, have burning at your house that he would qualify to say that? He ain't got no kind of fire. You, if you have a heater, it might say he'd be trying to burn himself on a heater or something. 
Or he might be trying to turn the stove on and burn his hand on the stove. I mean, you know, we wouldn't have that. So we, the, look at the context of what's going on here. But his father realized that, man, this is not normal behavior. It's something up with this. He's not supposed to be acting like this. When is the body of Christ going to wake up and stop calling what God clearly called a curse and we've been calling it normal? It's not normal for people to forget him. Alzheimer's and dementia is not normal to the ch children and people of God. You say, why? Because God gave us a spirit that brings everything back to our remembrance. The Holy Ghost not going to let you forget. So why are people forgetting then? Because they're operating under a curse instead of the blessing. I'm talking about Christian people. That can't happen to me. You say, how? Because I just told you. I got the spirit of God. He ain't going to let me forget. And then he said he didn't give me that. He didn't give me a spirit of forget. He didn't give me a spirit of dementia. Holy Ghost don't forget stuff. He didn't say, oh, I forgot. Let me go ask the Father. I'll be back. No, he don't do that. He remembers everything, and he knows everything. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So people are yielding to something different, and then we got Christian people calling that stuff normal and taking them to the doctor. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not going to get doctors, but I'm just saying bring them to Jesus first. Yeah. See what Jesus says about it. Yeah. And I can guarantee you what Jesus is going to say to them. Bring them here to me. I wonder what are you going to do. He says, and I brought him to your disciples, and they could not. Now, see, this is different from would not, which means they tried. They're going through the motions. I mean, how come we can't do that? We've done it before, and it worked, but this time it won't work. Remember what I just said earlier. Jesus said they're not fasting and praying. That's important to take note of that. Look at Jesus' response. That's okay. Just go ahead and bring it to me. I'll deal with it. <laughs> that, that ain't how Je that Jesus, Jesus is irritated. Because he expected them to do what he ordained them to do. Because he's training them to be like him. He's on the mountain with some other disciples, then had a supernatural encounter. And he comes down and finds this mess. He comes down and finds the church not doing what they're supposed to be doing. He comes down from the mountain finding out the church not even operating in power. And he comes down from the mountain finding out the church not operating in power because they've been eating too much. Then Jesus answered and said, oh, faithless and perverse generation. <laughs> now, you look at this word faithless, and then he said perverse. Now, if, that, if you was a disciple, I would have been like, hold up, hold up, hold, hold up, hold up. <laughs> look, <laughs> I mean, I would have had attitude. I would have had attitude, brother. Dave. I would have been like, you know what? Hold up. How you going to tell me? I ain't got no faith. I'm trying to, I'm trying to do something. I mean, I wouldn't have said that to him. I would have felt that way on the inside. You know how people, you know how, you know how most people, they, that's what they really, they, they acted out that moment, but they don't really do it. <laughs> they really acted out. I mean, it's amazing what goes through your mind. You see yourself body slamming that person, but then, yeah, you're just, just, I mean, you know, anybody ever made you mind? You saw yourself beating them down. And I mean, all in 30 seconds, you did everything. You didn't DDT them. I mean, you did everything. And you come back to yourself, oh, hold up. You know, I mean, I'm just saying that they're probably thinking that. Uh -huh. What you mean, tell me, ain't got no faith? Because how else would you act or respond on the inside? Because they're humans. And then he said, you perverse, which if you look this up, he says, twisted. Wow. He said, you have no faith and you're twisted. One, Noah's West uh, Destinary defines this word, you've turned aside. Now, to think that you have turned aside when you think you hadn't. So in some form or fashion, they actually didn't know. Okay, okay. Uh, that's, 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 that's heavy right there. I wonder how many Christians in the church, in the church, but really in their hearts, they're backslidden. They're turned aside. Yes. All because they hadn't been fasting. Yeah. 
Because we already see Jesus is going to say something here. All right? So twisted is the idea like you take wicker furniture and you twist it. He said, that's what's happening to you. And I can show you line upon line why this is happening to them. Because their master, every time he's having a crusade, you got three groups always spying out his meetings. You got the Pharisees, which is just simply religious people, which people that have been adding things to the traditional teachings of the Pentateuch. Then you have the Sadducees. Now, the, now the Pharisees, they, they, didn't, they didn't oppose miracles. But because of their religion and their doctrines of men, they made the word of God of no effect. Right? Now, the Sadducees, they didn't believe in the supernatural. Because that's why you see when Lazarus raised from the dead, it says the Sadducees were sitting with him when they were eating dinner. Because they didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. So they didn't believe in the supernatural. And then the Herodians, well, they were a political group. All three groups were always at Jesus' meetings. And whenever he saw them, the Bible, you can go read this. I'm not making this up. See, you got to read the Bible and let the Holy Ghost paint a picture to you. He came to his disciples. He said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Beware of the leaven of the Sadducees. Beware of the leaven of the Herodians. He was always warning them. Now, he wasn't saying, now, the word leaven is the word yeast. Pharisees, Sadducees, and, and, and Herodians weren't bread bakers. So he's talking about their teachings. He said, don't let their teachings get on the inside of you. Now, if that's true, then would that be true in our day? We shouldn't be listening to any minister that opposes the supernatural. He said, beware of their teachings. He said, because if that gets in you, it'll make the word of God of no effect. See, see some teaching system had affected them. It got in there when they didn't even realize it. See, that's why I don't go to other people's churches and meetings. I don't listen to preachers that ain't filled with the Holy Ghost. I don't care how good a word they got. Because it's something in their spirit that can get in me. I mean, that's just me. That's the choice I made. Because I'm not, I'm not willing to go backwards in any form or fashion. I'm only hanging out with people that believe in this book. I'm not people believe in the Holy Ghost but say, well, you don't have to speak in tongues. Well, you a liar. I don't care how big your ministry is. I'm, I'm just, I mean, that's the decision I made. And I believe Jesus operates like that. Because he's the one that sent the Holy Ghost. So you think he would uh, be okay with a minister saying he believed in the Holy Ghost, but then you don't have to speak in tongues? He wouldn't go for that. There will be a different Jesus. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And see, so, so something has gotten in there and twisted with their faith. All right? So now he says, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I endure you? Bring him here. Did he say what? Bring him what? He's not saying bring him to me because he's God. He knows who he is. He said, I can deal with this case. Bring him to me. I'm anointed. Glory be to God. I mean, that's how he's thinking. That's, not his, that's, the, that's thinking humility. That ain't pride. Because he said, let this mind be in you. He said, bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil. See, that's who he knew. He said, I can stand up again. It's the devil. Bring him here to me. I know how to deal with the devil because I faced him in the wilderness. And I won. He said, he rebuked the devil and he departed out of him. And the child was cured from that very hour or very moment. Now, notice verse 19. This is a teaching moment because this is how you should respond. Okay. And this also lets me know that you can be in a meeting and things be happening in a meeting. Things could be said in a meeting that you don't agree with. But that's not time for you to get offended and judge me and say, I'm wrong. And you say, I never come again back to Rain Life Church. Go to Jesus and ask him privately, is what I said the truth? You see, because see, they're being rebuked publicly. Because of what he said. But notice verse 19. Then the disciples came to Jesus apart or privately and said, why could not we cast him out? Man, that's a good question. Because they, there was nothing in them that thought that they were doing something wrong. They, so they're saying, why, how come we couldn't do this? Which means they've done it before. And by the way, Judas was one of them. Did you know Judas cast out devils? Because if Judas did not cast out devils, if Judas was not used by God to lay hands and to promote healing, then he would have been, everybody would have known he was a traitor. Yeah. 
they be like, oh, I already know who's going. Oh, I already know. Who, I already know who's going to portray Jesus because every time he tell us to have an altar call, you know, Judas over there standing in the corner. Wow. I ain't never seen Judas laying hands or casting out no devil. Yeah, now, yeah, now, yeah, now I think about that. He got to be the one that's going to betray Judas. You better not do nothing. Wow. You see how you can be a Christian? Do all these things and totally backslid, backslide and lose your soul. But anyway, so that that that's just that's just that won't cost you anything. That was free. <laughs> now nah, just let's, but anyway, but anyway, look at verse nineteen. I mean, uh, verse twenty. And Jesus said to them, "Because of your what?" Amen. Now, what did Jesus say? Amen. Period. The reason why they couldn't do this is because they truly did not believe, even when they thought they did. I don't know about you. When I was reading that one time, I was like, wow. How could I ever walk above this? How could I walk above this when I think I don't have this? Because how would I ever know to deal with it? How would I know how to deal with this when I don't want this? I don't, never, I don't ever want to be put in a position to where I'm trying to do something and it don't work. Can there be a way I can live above that scenario? Because after all, if I want to be like my master, he was never put in a situation that ever caught him off guard. That's right. John chapter 8, they brought to him a woman that was naked. He didn't expect them to bring him a naked woman. That's right. But he wasn't caught off guard. He just looked down and looked around in the dirt. And so many people trying to write uh, sermons and stuff talking about what he wrote in the dirt. First of all, stop that mess. That's right. The Bible doesn't tell us what he wrote. Uh, yes, it's a little dumb matter. Now, I can tell you this. This is what I believe the Holy Ghost told me. It ain't even about the writing. He said the reason why he immediately looked down and he didn't look at that woman because they would accuse him of lust. And that was in the old covenant. Don't look upon a woman to lust. They would have been like, oh, he's looking at that woman's breast. And they would have tried to stone him. You see? He just simply, yeah, you know, and I know it was the Holy Ghost because the whole time he was looking down when they was accusing him. And he said, okay, he that is without sin, let him go ahead and throw the first rock. Actually, when the rock, it was a stone. And then the Bible says they one by one, from the youngest to the oldest, left to where he was standing alone with the woman. And it was only when she was alone he looked at her. She's, he said, where are your accusers? She said, I have none. He didn't have any either. <laughs> you see what I'm saying here? See, he was never put in a situation to where he didn't know what to do. That's why you always should confess. I'm always at the right place at the right time. And when I get there, I know what to do. I know what to say. I'm never caught off guard. But how do you put yourself in that place? By continually putting your flesh under on a weekly basis. So that scenario don't even show up. You say, how do I know that? Let's keep reading. Because of your unbelief. For truly I say to you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, remove from here to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible to you. However, this kind, this kind. See, some people don't know how to separate one conversation from another, even though they're related. Because remember, he's dealing with this issue publicly, right? But then when they got along privately, the question was, how come we couldn't do this? Which starts a whole separate conversation, but it's also related to what happened earlier. And the subject is, because you didn't believe. So the kind that he's talking about is unbelief. He's not talking about devils. Think about this. If there were only certain devils that only come out by fasting and prayer, how would you ever know? How would you ever know that's one of them? If a demon's manifesting in a service, like a demon post manifest right here, I couldn't say, if, if I hadn't been living a lifestyle of fasting and prayer, I couldn't say, hold on, man, keep your demon because I hadn't been praying and fasting. And I think you caught one of them kind of demons. So come back in two days. 
No, come back in 24 hours. They might be dead in 24 hours. So what Jesus is addressing is this kind of unbelief. Now, I'm about to tell you what kind. He just told you. The kind that is so subtle that comes in unnoticed and is braided and twisted in with your faith, making you an inoperator. See, we pick up stuff. I like Brother Hagin said, he said, we pick up stuff out there. Yeah. What do you think the term comes? Shake the dust off your feet. Mm. Shake off the dust of the day. Yeah. Let your problems remain at that door. Come in here now. Put that out of your mind. Come in here and partake of this real food, partake of your real life so you can know how to deal with these things when you leave. Yeah. You see, so many things can come on inside of our soul and get even get in our inner man sometimes. And then we attempt to pray, we attempt to give the faith command and it doesn't really work because we're not in full faith. Yeah. We're low. We're running on low, you see. Yeah. And it says, so however, this kind comes out by fasting and prayer. That's what he's talking about. So the results, one of the results of fasting and praying is you eliminate this kind of unbelief. If you would just fast at least one day a week, one day a week, you'll deal with that. You'll deal with that. You say, how I can tell you? Because it's in the book. You'll deal with that. Now, um, Esther chapter 4, verse 10 through 17, look at that. Now, Taking this account right here, you don't have to pray and fast to cast out certain devils. But now, now think about this now. But this is also the context that we need to consider. That certain issues can only be dealt with only by praying and fasting. Do you get what I just said? Yes. Meaning sometimes, like, let me give an example. Let's just sum wrong. Uh, Turn the whole nation upside down for Jesus once called, uh, over in the Philistines. God told him to go there to start a ministry. Say so he went there, it was just hard, with nothing opening up. And uh, he heard about this young girl that was demon possessed that was in the psych ward. And the Holy Ghost said, Go deliver that woman. But he had Lester Summerall prepare himself through prayer and fasting before he went to go do it. And it took him a process of, I think, two or three days to get this young girl fully delivered from this demon, which, which actually, see, this is how some people don't realize how spiritual things work. Like, believe it or not, this demon was the demon that was responsible for no churches and the ministry of the Lord Jesus for getting established in that nation that was in that one woman. That's how these things work. And Daniel, that's what Daniel was talking to us about, principalities that rule territories through people. Right? So when this woman was fully delivered, revival broke out and churches began to populate and to be established in the Philistines to where now people go to the Philistines. But God used a man to open it up called Lester Summerall. And he wrote about it in one of his book. He wrote about his life and ministry. But think about what would happen if he didn't prepare himself through praying and fasting. Because see, that's what we see Jesus doing in Luke chapter 4. If he didn't prepare himself through praying and fasting, he wouldn't have come out with that level of anointing on his life. That's what we're talking about here. There are certain, certain things you can't break over into unless you go through this time of praying and fasting, you see. Certain deliverances won't happen unless you initiate praying and fasting. Praying alone just doesn't get the job done like we thought. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 4, if my people that are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. So that means the humility and praying are two different things because he said humble and. And is a, a conjunction that joins two different things together. The humbling part is the fasting part. Because David said, I humble myself through fasting. See, they just had a, 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 a day of prayer because of this war going over there in, 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 in what, Jerusalem, over there across this ocean. But I didn't hear anybody talk about fasting and praying, but you quoting that scripture. And the Holy Ghost said, that's, that's, that's wrong. They're doing that wrong. See, that's, that's what maturity will do for you as a believer. As you grow with your Lord, you will realize where we've been wrong and how we don't get full victory and success by so-called operating by the word because we realize we've been doing it wrong. See, maturity is being like your master. You say, man, Lord, I see where I missed it. I remember all those years in early 2000, you telling me to fast and I was disobedient and I didn't do it. I'm talking about me. 
I didn't start getting back and doing this telling till uh, 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 October. Because I got the date because I want to share something. There's something that happened that showed up as a sign and a witness. And, uh, but let's just read this first. Esther chapter 4, verse 10. I'm going to use your board. It said, again, Esther spoke unto Hattach and gave him commandment unto Mordecai. All the king's servants and all the people of the king's province do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come into the king into the inner court who is not called there is, is one law of his to put him to death. Now, this is a law from the king. Except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter, that he may live. But I have not been called to come into the king these 30 days. Now, what is Esther saying? Well, first of all, who is Esther? She's the queen. Now, just by being queen doesn't exempt you from the law. Just by being Christian <laughs> don't exempt you. This is huge. Now, if anybody that should be able to go and see a husband, it should be the queen. But there's a law preventing her from acting that way. See, we got to learn how to separate our natural lives from our spiritual lives. Like, like, for example, the reason why when we come in here, we address each other as a brother and sister or, or whatever is because there's something greater at work among us. It's called royal protocol. That we actually believe that Jesus is in this room, angels in this room, and they're regarding our behavior or they're looking at how we behave ourselves in the house of God. You know that's a verse I just quoted. It's called honor. It's called honor. And they're watching this, right? So, so this is the law. And they told to Mordecai Esther word, Esther's words. Now look how Mordecai. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther. So they're writing each other back and forth. Think not with yourself that you will escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if you all together hold your peace at this time, then there shall enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will be destroyed. And who knoweth whether you are coming to the kingdom for such a time as this? See, we like to quote that. But in the context, he says, how do you not know? The reason why you in this position is for this very moment. I know what you're telling me. I know you're telling me that you can't do such and such. You can't go up in your husband's court because he made a law that everybody, anybody just can't walk up in there. I know what you're saying, but I'm just letting, I'm just going to ask you a question. How do you not know if you come into the kingdom such a time as this? Now, notice what she didn't do. She didn't say, yeah, you know, I even never dreamed about being king, and then one day all this happened. I know that had to be God. She just didn't operate by assumption and say, let me just go and go up and it is my husband. I know I'm going to have some favor. That's not how she responded. She knew a secret. Let's keep reading. Then Esther bade them return to Mordecai this answer. Go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan and fast you for me. Now she's working with what? Let me find out if I really came into the kingdom for such a time as this. Oh, glory, this is good. This is good. She said, let me find out. Let me find out. Oh, see, you never put this together, have you? Never. This is so good. Oh, it's so good. It tastes good, doesn't it? <laughs> it? Just come and taste the Lord. See, it's good. Now, it says, and fast for me, and neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise, and so will I go into the king, which is not according to the law, and if I die, I die. <laughs> this is heavy stuff right here. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther had commanded him. Now, pull up uh, chapter 5 and verse 1. We're going to see what happened as a result of her fasting and praying. I want you to see the context. Even though they don't say they were praying, we know they were praying. Because if they didn't add prayer with it, they're just simply starving and dieting. Okay? Now it came to pass on the third day. The, what's the third day when she came off a of fast? Mm -hmm. That Esther put on her royal apparel and stood in the inner court, which was against the law. Stood in the inner court of the king's house over against the king's house, and the king sat upon his royal throne in the royal house over against the gate of the house. And it was so, when the king saw Esther the queen standing in the court, that she obtained favor. See, favor was released. 
See, see, we, 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 it's not a mystery. What initiated that favor? See, see, certain things in victory, favor won't show up. But if you fast and pray, it'll show up. This favor showed up. See, fa now we see what favor is really designed to do. Change the odds. <laughs> favor ain't getting the parking, front parking space at HEB. That's just an opportunity. They ain't got nothing to do with no favor. Because you probably need to be walking. Because you hadn't been fasting. Not that, not that, not that, not that, not that. Now think about that. We said, that's the fog rolled in. No, that wasn't the fog. You just happen to be at the right place at the right time. But when favor shows up in the Bible, it changes the odds. So it says, she obtained favor in the sight, and the king held out his golden scepter and asked her, what do you want up to the half of my kingdom? And then she was able to tell him about the plan of that wicked man about killing the Jews. Yeah. See, how did deliverance come? Yeah. When a nation decided to fast and pray. Did God always want to deliver them? Yes. But we've got to understand this. God's not moving because they fasted and prayed. God moved because they positioned themselves to believe and trust. Because think about that. What if you got word that all y'all about to be wiped out in a matter of days? How would that rock your soul? Mm -hmm. Would you be willing to not eat when you got that news? Most people go into the state of depression and get big. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about eat. When people get bad news, they get depressed and they do a bunch of eating, they get overweight. And they'll tell you, say, how'd you get this big? Well, I, I got depressed one time in my life and all I did was just eating Doritos and Twinkies and honey buns and you know, I didn't see how I was going to come out. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm just not trying to make fun of anybody, but I'm just saying how many people, you know, get depressed. All they do is eat. So they didn't get depressed. They didn't eat. They said, we're not going to put ourselves in that position to where we depressed. We're going to fast and pray. And while we fasting, we're going to seek God. Mm -hmm. Right now. Here's another one. And then I want to tell you something that happened to me now. I want to show you where Paul fasted, okay? Now, let me, let me say something here. I can tell you two places. Well, I'll show you probably about three or four places where Paul fasted. But, in, but I'm going to show you one. But when you read his letters, he don't teach on it. Paul doesn't teach on fasting. But we see Paul teaching on everything else. He taught about the importance of prayer. He taught about the importance of giving. But this other pillar he didn't teach on. And you might ask yourself this question. Why didn't Paul teach on something that was so important? Let me tell you why. Because it was expected that you fasted. So he didn't need to teach on it. Okay, let me say that again. See, that wasn't a real deep answer, right? He didn't teach on it because it was expected that you fasted. Now, they have some other writings. It's called a, uh, I don't know if you know about this, Brother Day. It's called a didac. D-I-D-A-C-H-E. And some, some of y'all can write that down. D-I-D-A-C-H-E. And you can pull up a PDF version of this. These are other writings that the apostles wrote to each other amongst themselves to the churches that had oversight of, which are writings that were based on the letters, the word of God. And in those letters, there was, a, there was a guidelines on how, well, not, not how, there were guidelines on when they should fast as a body of believers, which they changed it, and that's why they wrote it in there. See, the Jewish culture, they would fast on Mondays and Thursdays of every week. But because Jesus called them hypocrites, they didn't want to be named with a bunch of hypocrites. So when they established the church, they kept the tradition which was the fast every week for two days, but they changed the days to Wednesdays and Fridays. So I want you to think about this. This is an impact statement of every person that we read that he's writing to in the Bible, in the New Testament. Those people fasted twice a week. Period. What's that say about you? You see why we got to talk about this, Sister Carol? I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say two things. 
These people were actually the letters that we're reading. That's so good, Lord. He said, say it this way. <laughs> These teachings are letters from Paul or letters to the churches that he established. So what do you think he taught them? He taught them the same things he learned from Jesus. He taught them fasting. He taught them giving. And he taught them about prayer. But also, these people in these churches were tongue talkers. And we know it because in Acts 19, he found some. He found some Baptist people. Some people kept laughing at that, but he did. Because he said, what doctrine? He said, John the Baptist. So they were Baptists, meaning they were following after the Baptist doctrine, which is mainly baptizing water. Did you know that's one of the main things they teach, the Baptists? And they say speaking in tongues of the devil. But Paul said, no, nah, let me show you a more excellent way. And then the Bible says he went and baptized them in the name of the Lord. And he says he baptized with the Holy Ghost for he heard them speak with tongues and they prophesied. And then a church was birthed out of those men. And there was 12 of them. So every person that we read, these letters were written to people that were spirit-filled. So you're going to have a hard time understanding the Bible if you don't not feel the Holy Ghost. Because you don't have the right filter. I mean, you wouldn't try to put a 16 by 10 filter in a 20 by 30 slot, right? And think it should fit, huh? So why are you trying to fit the word of God in your life and you refusing to filter? But anyway, um, so, so, so I want you to think about that. So Paul didn't need to teach on it. So they fasted on Wednesdays and Fridays. Now, I don't mean you have to do it on Wednesdays and Fridays, but I think it's interesting that the early church, they always fasted twice every week. So if you want to meet the biblical requirement, I, you should be able to fast at least twice every week. It's only two days out of seven. I just happen to do Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays. And the reason, and to tell you the truth, the reason why I end up doing Thursdays is because I used to fast on Thursdays anyway. Because I don't like to eat before I come, come minister. You feel full. I did that one time. I said, I'll never do that again, Lord. If you get me through this preaching session, I would never eat a burger again before I minister. <laughs> Seriously. It's amazing how that works. Never violate that again. Mm. So let's look at Acts chapter 27. You know Paul was in a shipwreck, right? And he should have died. Along with the men that were on the ship. You say, how can you should have died? Because remember the unction came, Sister Bertha. He said, look, we don't need to get on this boat. Because I perceive this voyage to be with great danger. That's God warning them, you know. Don't get on that boat. But because Paul was a preacher and not a shipsman. He said, we ain't going to listen to no preacher. I know more about boats than this dude. Dude, you stick to the Bible. I mean, he didn't say that. Because he, he, <laughs> he wouldn't have had that reference point. But I mean, he just ignored him because he, he didn't, he didn't, he went over a fleet of ships and stuff. He was inexperienced. He didn't know what he was talking about. See, God can let you know about stuff you inexperienced about. You're not limited. So now they were in the ship at, at sea and Let's read in verse um, um, 18 to 25. Let's look at this. Acts chapter 27, verse 18 to 25. And we being exceedingly tossed with the tempest, the next day they lightened the ship. And the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. And we, when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. You know what he's saying here? Now, everybody that's on that boat, because you know you're using sail. You ain't got no motor. <laughs> you ain't got no Yamaha on the back of that thing. Right? So you need some wind to potentially blow you in the direction where you think land's going to be. So they're in a place where they had a bunch of wind being tossed to and fro, and they lighten the ship. Now there comes a situation where there's no wind. See, just like glass, just so calm. But then it's so dark, you probably can't even see your hand in front of your face. You say, how do I say that? Because the sun and the moon's not shining, and there are no stars. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, utter despair hit them, which means we ain't going to ever get out of this situation right here. All hope has been lost. But see, this is what's so powerful. They didn't realize who they had on the boat. See, your job is blessed because you there. 
See, see, that's what you got to get in your inner man. Company will go under if you're not there. I mean, you know what I'm saying? You got to realize who you are. Because look what happened. Look what, let's keep reading this now. I'm, I'm, I'm helping, y'all helping me. All right. But after long, what? Now, you look this up. Abstinence means voluntarily not doing something. What is he volunteering not to do? Eat. Why did he choose not to eat? That's not a time to starve yourself. He needed supernatural help and he needed it. He knew it. He said, I'm going to fast during this time. Man, who does that? Who does that coming out of a hurricane? Ship broke up. You didn't have to throw some stuff overboard and say, you know, I'm going to fast and pray right now. I ain't trying to fast and pray when my life's on the line. Right. Or should you? But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, I have good news. I mean, that's what I added. I mean, come on, that's what he's saying. You should have listened to me. See, that's how I told you moment. See, that ain't wrong. It ain't wrong to have I told you moment, brother. He said, I told y'all. Y'all should have listened to me. <laughs> and not have loosed from Crete. And to have gained this harm and loss. And now I want to encourage you. Start getting happy, y'all. Now, look, everybody ain't feeling like getting happy. But that's what that means, Be of good cheer. Start smiling. Put a smile on your face. Like I tell my kids, is something wrong with you? No, I said, let your face know it then. <laughs> For there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the ship. Man, how could a man say this? But they listening to him now. You say, why? Because he remembered what they told, what he said to him. He said, man, yeah, we wouldn't listen to him. We wouldn't be in this ship, so let's listen to him now. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am and whose I serve. See, God sent him an angel while he was what? Fasting and praying. Because there's never a time that when you're praying that angels are not attending to those prayers. They're the ones that carry the prayers up to the throne. Angels are agents of prayer. That's why you want to be praying. Some of y'all are like, let's go pray right now. I mean, I mean, but, but I'm saying, I ain't, look, that angel came and stood and told him this. Look, 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 saying, this is what that angel said, fear not. That means Paul was in fear. He said, fear not, Paul, for you must be brought before Caesar. And lo, God had given thee all them that sail with you. Now, notice this now. Notice this man's heart. Why did an angel say that to him? Because he must have been praying that. He must have been saying, Father, give me these men's lives that no man's life be lost. Because he could have said the opposite. Hey, look, I'm going to let them, some of them drown because they know I told them, put us in this position. <laughs> That's how some Christians probably would have prayed, you need some more love in you. <laughs> Think about that. So think about that. So people don't say, people, this is, this, this, this is a little something I want to punch in here. I mean, throw in there. People try to talk about that covering is not real, but you can't tell these men that. Because you know what that testimony was? Exactly what this man said. He said, look, here, we was on that boat, and he told us not to get on that boat. But let me tell you why we're alive today. Because he said he was fasting, and an angel came and talked to him, and that angel told him our lives will be saved because he prayed for us. So that means that men and women can serve as a covering over people's lives to escape certain judgment. Yeah. But anyway, that's, that's a reality. It's the truth. And so he says, he's giving you all the men that sail with thee. And in verse 25, Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me, and it was so. They lost the ship, and the devil messed up and left some driftwood. <laughs> and they hung on that wood and drifted right onto an island. And then, a, and then a crusade broke out. Healing miracles. Remember that? It said a guy with a bloody flux needed to be healed, and they laid hands on Matter of fact, the Bible says the first thing that happened, it says a serpent attached himself to it, and he shook it off in the fire. So shook it off in the fire and suffered no harm. And they thought he was a god. Well, at first they thought he was a criminal. Like, hold up, this man. Look here, let me just watch him see if he swell up. He didn't swell up. Then a revival broke out. But see, all that happened. Because he initiated something when he ended that time of fasting and praying. Now, 
I want you to, I'm going to close this because I have some other stuff I want to say. But I'm, I'm getting to the place where I need to be quiet. Not right this moment, but, you know, I, that'll put me another 45 minutes and we ain't got that. I'm not going to take that time. Because I did want to mention something about the Daniel Fast and line upon line, but I'll tell you that next time. Um, praise the Lord. Now, when I was meditating on the word fast, when I was in the back there before I came out this morning, the Holy Ghost said to me, now I want you to think about this. When you do not eat food, what word do we use? Fast. The Holy Ghost said to me, he said, go look that word up in the Noah's Webster Dictionary. And I looked it up, and it has three different definitions. One definition is, is to not eat food. One definition means, of, of the definition of fast is, is to firmly lay hold of something. See, if we were in, grew up in the English society, they'll say, put those in fast, which means stop. So, you know, you, know you, you lay hold, you seize it, you lay hold on it, right? But also fast means to accelerate. And so when I looked up, the Holy Ghost said to me, he said, that's what happens when you fast. You lay hold of your answer and you accelerate the process. Now think about that. And I know that's the truth because of what I'm getting ready to share with you. Now I'm not going to go into all the details, but I'm going to just tell you what happened. Because I didn't even know if I was going to share this publicly. I shared it with our leaders. But I, I just didn't know how to share this publicly without giving certain details, but the Holy Ghost gave me wisdom. Well, on July the 14th, I, I'll say this much. On July the 14th, um, we, had some, we had an air condition go out in our house. And we had an air condition put in our home, re replaced, while we're on vacation, while we're out of town. Uh, we came back on the 15th. The work was done on the 14th. And I noticed then when that thing was happening without going into detail. So now that was July the 14th. We had an air condition put in our installed in our home, right? Now on August the 28th, I discovered that one of my guns was missing out of my gun safe. This is what I'm saying now. And I know it had to have been then, because we went home. And I'm not going to go into details on how I could, but, but it was stolen. I discovered it was missing. It was gone. And so, and I discovered this early in the morning. Uh, and I was like, man, and, and, until I see you sleeping, and, and I woke up, because I was just, man, I, I mean, because it's one of my guns. And here it is, August 28th. You say, how can you know it before you? I don't know. I just had a strong unction to go check my gun case all this time after that time. And I realized it was gone. And I have another gun in there. They didn't take that. And then, the, and then they took the, the, this particular gun that had hollow part bullets in it, you know. And, uh, and I saw I woke Tadasi up and I said, man, one of my guns is missing. You know, and we began to scratch our head. And I said, it had to have been this time or, or whatever, you know. And I was so upset. I was upset about it, man. I was upset. But I knew I, what I needed to do immediately was call the Paraland Police Department and tell them what happened because that gun was registered in my name. And I didn't want that gun to have been committed in a crime and then I'm attached to it, right? So, but before we did that, I got my composure because it only works when you do it with the right attitude. I said, I need you to get an agreement with me. I need you to get an agreement with me. And she said, okay, I get an agreement with you. So I said, I, take, I said, Father, I take that mighty name, that name that has been given to me that's above every name, that at that name, all three realms respond to that name. So I take that name and I say in the name of Jesus that gun will not be used in a crime. And I said according to Romans chapter 13 
that the perpetrator that has taken my possession will be arrested by those ministers. Did you get what I just said? You know, Romans 13 said he has other ministers. It's called the, the, the police department. I said they'll be arrested by those ministers. And I said because you work through the authorities, I said they will be caught and apprehended. And I say, ministering spirits, you go forth and you apprehend that individual. And that property will be returned back to me because that's my property. It has my name on it. It doesn't belong to them in Jesus' name. That's all I said. And am I telling you the truth? Didn't pray about it again. Thought about it, but didn't open my mouth and say, what? what? I, we just prayed it, right? So now I want you to think about this. God had been dealing, now that was on August the 28th, okay? Listen, so it had to have been taken on July 14th. That was August 28th. We made that, that wasn't even really prayer if you really notice what I just said. When we say prayer, that really ain't prayer. I'm using my authority. I had a right to use my authority because that stuff was stolen from me. And that's not right to have stuff stolen from you. That's my stuff. Matter of fact, we added this. I said, angels, you bring me my stuff because one of your functions is to apprehend and watch over territory and to watch over property. Did you know that's true? You find that in the Bible. That's why you see them sitting at the head of Jesus and the footage is where he was buried. They watching that property. That's God's property. Your body is God's property. Now, so, when I got serious about fasting, because I dated it, I fasted on October 3rd, 4th and 5th was a Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and I came off of my fast on the 6th, which was a Friday at 11 a.m., right? Then, then on Monday morning, so that was Friday, I came off the fast, then you had Saturday, Sunday, and then that Monday at 12.07 a.m., I get a phone call from the Friendswood Police Department saying, is this Mr. Bookman? I said, this is Mr. Bookman. They said, D did you report a gun that was stolen? I said, yes, I did. He said, is that gun still stolen? I said, yes, it is. He says, well, we just recovered your property. They said, we just recovered your property. And you need to provide evidence that that's your property. Now, I had all the paperwork and all that kind of stuff. And so I went to go pick it up. I picked it up on, I picked it up on that, that, yeah, that two, I picked it up on that Tuesday. And so when I went to go talk to the officer, I said, if you don't mind me asking, I said, how did you get this gun? Now, let me show you how I operated. Now, when they returned it back to me, Sister Claudia, they returned it to me as it was, bullets in the clip, hollow points or whatever. But then it was in a nice concealed carry case. I could have said, yeah, I'm going to take that too. You should have been taking my gun. I didn't do that. I said, that's not my case. You can keep that. See, it's important for me to walk in integrity. Because I'm walking, with, I'm walking with, with the Lord. I'm walking with the spirit realm. That ain't a bonus. I mean, that ain't a bonus reward because he should have took my gun. I said, he said, that's not y'all. And he was surprised. Like, man, why'd you be honest like that? I said, because it ain't mine. You know? And so I asked him, I said, how did you apprehend him? He, this is his own words. He said, we just happened to do a routine traffic stop. And we found out he had this gun. Wow. There wasn't no routine traffic stop. It was a Holy Ghost. I know it wasn't routine because I, well, I prayed. I prayed that he used those ministers. So you can't tell me fasting and praying don't work. You can't tell. Because see, that wasn't a coincidence to me because look at all the time that passed and then after I got serious with the Lord, I said, okay, I'll do it. I'll fast. And then that sign showed up. It almost kind of shocked me. It was so quick. I was like, hold up. And so I just wanted to share that with you. And I want to encourage you. Begin to fast. I know me and my house, we, I mean, to lots of we're doing it. But our kids say they're going to do it. I hope, you know, they do it. Hope they're strengthened. Um, and I believe they'll do it, you know. Uh, trust them. 
trust that God's working on the inside of them. And so they're going to do 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. on Wednesdays, you know. And then the Lord has given us a plan starting in January how to fast that month in January. We're going to start off with one day, then two days, then three days, you know, and then go back to one for that month of January. And we're just going to believe God's going to do some supernatural things in your lives and, and, and just some things in this church. Amen. Amen. And so uh, that's all I got. Praise the Lord. You got something you want to share with the people? You just want to make some announcements. Well, praise the Lord. Did you receive anything today? Yes. Praise God. Well, I want you to always remember you are who God says you are. Glory be to God.